Welcome to the Unlist, guys. This is going to be the first part of a two-part series covering the house of Girlong. This is a house with too much history. I cannot fit it into one video, so I am breaking it into two. And it will be just in time for the end of Gear April, which is the month-long celebration of this house. I've already done a video about Gear April, and I named some of my favorite Girlong fragrances. So this is the promised history of the house. This first video will cover the first three house perfumers. Then the second video will cover the next three. Now only four of the total six house perfumers this brand has had across nearly 200 years are actually Guerlain family. The first four, which is Pierre-Francois Pascal Guerlain, followed by his son, Amy Guerlain, who was then followed by his nephew, Jean-Jacques Guerlain, who was then also followed by his nephew, Jean-Paul Guerlain. After that, it moved from the Guerlain family to just whoever corporate owners LVMH decided to hire. And for a while, it was uh, Jean-Paul Guerlain competing against several other people that were submitting briefs to the brand. And he lost some, he won some. It went like that. And then eventually uh, he stepped down in 2002, which meant that the House of Guerlain was for the first time not head by a master perfumer who was family. Thus it became the post Guerlain era of Guerlain, which is confusing, I know, post Guerlain, Guerlain, right? But that's what it was. And we saw uh, German perfumer Thierry Vasa step up and he became house perfumer through the 2000s most of the 2010s as well, until eventually he was joined by an assistant who then took his place in just a couple years, uh, Delphine Jelk, who in the last year or two has stepped in. And Thierry Vasa has stayed on board in a more curative role for the older fragrances, maintaining their integrity, if you will, through reformulation, while Delphine makes all of the new fragrances for the house. So now, this first episode is going to deal mainly with those first three Guerlain family perfumers, which is going to be Pierre-Francois Pascal Guerlain, Amy Guerlain, and then Jean-Jacques Guerlain, better known as just Jacques Guerlain. Typically, he didn't refer to himself as Jean-Jacques, but that's his full name. This house formed in 1828. That's right, I said it correctly, 1828, not 1928. So that means we are four years away from 200th anniversary for this house. Very old house. Now, not the oldest, but definitely the oldest continually operating French perfume house. There are other houses that are technically older, like Hubagant, but they've died and been relaunched a couple of times. So they haven't consistently operated since they started. Otherwise, I think Hubagant would probably be the oldest going back to like the 1700s. But like I said, they've crashed and burned a handful of times in that span, that almost 300 year span. So in terms of oldest house that's never shuttered, never taken a year off, <laughs> Guerlain is it for France, definitely, in terms of perfume houses. I'm leaving out like the suppliers and grass. Some of those guys have been around a long time and they do make their own perfumes as well, like Fragonard, Molinard, all those. But proper houses, no, it's, it, it's Guerlain. It's, it's definitely Guerlain. So the whole thing about this house, when it first formed, uh, <clears throat> Pierre-Francois Pascal Guerlain, or just Pierre Guerlain for ease of memory, he was purely a bespoke perfumer because that's how it was. In the late 18th century and early 19th century, there was not a call for mass perfumery. I mean, you literally just had colognes. Colognes were the first real volume produced, batch produced fragrance that people could buy. And we have uh, Jean-Marie Farina to thank for that and, and um, Wilhelm Mullins and all that stuff. But those guys, when they made their colognes, they were more for sanitary purposes. They weren't for fragrance. The fragrance was kind of ancillary to the main purpose of being a heavy alcohol sanitizing, something you can splash on, something you can sponge, sponge yourself down with, 
you know, if you were Napoleon, you bathed in it because he was crazy. But <laughs> it was basically a refreshing, uplifting uh, sort of sanitary thing for people who didn't want to always just bathe with soap and water or didn't want to draw a full hot bath because in those days, that was a lot of work, right? We didn't have uh, plumbing and uh, boilers like, you know, like we do now. We take for granted hot water heaters. Back then, they had to actually heat their bathtub. They had to draw the water from somewhere. If they were lucky enough to have indoor piping, they did have that, but then the water still had to be heated somehow, so they had to light the underside of the bathtub and just hope you don't boil yourself while you're in there, right? <laughs> so anyway, the colognes were really it. Anything else was bespoke. 100% custom bespoke. And that is what good old Pierre Francois Pascal Guerlain did. And he eventually caught the attention of Napoleon III and his wife, Empress uh, you know, and Beatrice Eugene, right? So Napoleon III was part of the Second Empire, or rather he created the Second Empire, a very short-lived empire, by the way. Wasn't around very long. But he attracted his attention after, you know, moving up through high society with all of his custom fragrances that was drawing attention. Uh, so he was commissioned to make a bespoke cologne just for Napoleon III. And that would become the now well-known, well-celebrated Cologne du Imperial, right? Released in the uh, 18, I think, 1840s, maybe? Yeah, I'm a little fudgy on the dates there on that one. But whenever that one came out, it was a big success. And eventually, Napoleon III allowed it to be sold to the public because that was PR for him, right? Yeah, this is my official, my official cologne that the masses can now purchase from my official court perfumer. Pierre Guerlain is my court perfumer, and I'm allowing him to sell my custom fragrance to all of you people. Let them eat cake, right? So free PR. And uh, it helped put Guerlain on the map, obviously. Suddenly, all of the royals were wanting fragrances from Guerlain. And this is a story that Creed used to steal Creed used to steal this fucking story and make it their own. Creed used to claim that they made fragrances for Napoleon III, that they made fragrances for his wife, Empress Eugenie. The whole Jasmine and Petrus Eugenie fragrance was a fragrance that they concocted and said that they made for her, right? And then they, they did it again because Guerlain actually historically documented Guerlain had commissions and royal warrants from Queen Victoria, okay? From Queen Victoria in the UK and a handful of other monarchs in and around Europe, okay? They held those royal warrants. They held those contracts to make those fragrances. But wouldn't you know, Creed claimed that they were the ones that made those fragrances, that they were the ones. And they tried to hawk those fragrances in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s and early 90s. All those gray caps that I talked about Creed had. That was Creed basically trying to eat Guerlain's lunch, trying to steal their thunder. And it's hilarious. Those fragrances that Guerlain made for the royals are more or less lost to history. We don't know what they are. We'll probably never know what they are. They weren't exactly kept on public record because they were bespoke. I mean, Napoleon III allowed his cologne to be you know, mass produced and sold, but that's because, again, he wanted that PR, even though he was dethroned anyway, right? He wasn't in power very long. The short span of time that he was actually the ruler of France, this fragrance was out, and they continued to sell after that because there was plenty of loyal sentiment, you know, even though they got reorganized to get into a republic. But that didn't really hurt Guerlain's image at all, of course. They just kept rolling. Unfortunately, in the 18... 60s, uh, Pierre would pass away, and that would leave the business to his sons. And his two sons, one of them would take up the reins as house perfumer, and the other would manage the business. And that tandem relationship would continue into the 20th century, actually. So, Amy Guerlain was the son who was actually the house perfumer. 
and the other one whose name eludes me right now because obviously if you're the bookkeeper in the back room doing all the paperwork, your name doesn't get to be in lights. It's on Wikipedia if you want to know who that person is, the brother of Amy Guerlain, but he was not involved with perfumery anyway. So it's Amy Guerlain's name that gets remembered because he was the one that actually made the perfume, right? Because <laughs> that's just kind of how it works. You know, history is written by the victors, right? So he was the one out in front holding the perfume bottles. So he's the name that everyone remembers, not his brother, unfortunately. The poor guy back there doing taxes and whatever and flipping through pages and manifests and stuff. He's forgotten about. Like I said, on Wikipedia, you can look it up, but I don't remember his name. Amy Guerlain, however, had an entirely different vibe from his father. His father primarily just made custom fragrances. The only real public facing fragrance that his father made was that cologne, Cologne du Imperial. So, Aime Guerlain decided to do the exact opposite and sell bouquets that could be worn by anybody that were of a wider variety than just the single bergamot scented cologne. You know, Guerlain's upscale take on 4711 on Farina. Okay, so thus AIM set about creating a series of cologne waters because they were all colognes back then. There were no high concentration eau de parfums, parfum de toilettes. That stuff would come in the 20th century. Okay, guys, if you wanted something stronger than a cologne, you had oil. You just wore straight up perfume oil. You wore the oil right on the back of your neck, behind your ears, wherever you put it. They would make the oil perfumes for you. They would put them either, you would have a pomander that you could wear around your neck and you could put the perfume on the pomander or you could you know, dot it in places where you have pulse points, but that's it. It was the oil perfume or the colognes. There was no ratio mixture of oil and alcohol in between that. Although Amy Guerlain would eventually invent that, but put a pin in that. We're not there yet. So during Amy Guerlain's reign as Guerlain perfumer, he would create things like Fleurs, Fleurs d'Italie, Rococo. Okay, he would make the first Chypre Accord. He would make a bunch of Sol de Flor Accords. Okay, he would create a bunch of individual uh, subject colognes, okay, but the big one would be Jiki in 1889. And it would be the first fragrance that is considered a parfum because it was not made as a cologne water with hygienic properties. It was made as a scent first and foremost. High concentration, still had alcohol in it, still had water in it, but it was sold originally in a square bottle the same square bottles that the uh, L'Art and Materia collections come in, but, uh, you know, clear glass, made by Lely. Then it would switch to the uh, quadrupole bottles later, but originally it was those square bottles. And Jiki was designed as a perfectly abstract fragrance. So even though it was primarily based on the Fougere Accord as determined by the Hubegant fragrance, Fougere Royale, beginning a long tradition of Guerlain taking another perfumer's creations, modifying it, making it more complex. Aime Guerlain effectively took Fougere Royale that Paul Parquet had created and began to tinker with the concept, increase the complexity, move it in new directions, and eventually his nephew, Jean-Jacques Guerlain, would do the very same thing. He would look at a lot of fragrances being created by other perfumers who were his equal at the time, people like Francois Coty, for instance. And from their works, he would extrapolate, modify, and arguably improve, creating things like Shalimar, Mitsoko, Le Bleu, so on and so forth. But before we get to that, again, we're gonna put a pin in that. Let's talk about Jiki. Jiki was important not only because it was the first concentrated parfum, but it was also important because it was the first fragrance that a lot of men really enjoyed wearing. You have to understand that men had a different relationship with fragrance than women, even when it was just colognes. 
because men saw any kind of uh, overt scent as being feminine. Even the French, right? Now, it's hard to believe now. The French love their perfume, but in the 19th century and 18th century, for as gussied up with the powdered wigs and the pantalones and the macaroni style as they were, right, and the little fake uh, beauty marks on their face, they just there was an aversion to scent beyond just being clean. People bathed. Despite what you may think, people did bathe back then. They, they hand bathed with basins of water and stuff like that and soap. Maybe they didn't jump in a shower back then, but they did bathe. But they didn't want a heavily scented anything. And colognes were kind of a cool in-between because they were light, they were fresh, and they went away. However, Jicky broke that mold because Jicky got men interested in having a perpetual smell beyond <laughs> their own perpetual smell, right guys? So they got interested in having a perpetual smell because of Jicky. Fougere Royale, yes, to an extent, but it was really Jicky to the point where people actually, uh, nowadays, they look back and they hypothesize that maybe the so-called Jicky that Amy dedicated this fragrance to which was alleged to be a girl crush he had, was actually a guy. Because there are reports of Amy Guerlain being bisexual. But we're talking the 1800s, where any kind of anything like that could basically get you murdered, right? So that stuff was kept behind closed doors, you know, the whole in-the-closet thing. So it was talked up that Jicky was actually a girl interest of his that he dedicated the fragrance to. But being that far more men... Initially, far more men took interest in Jicky than women, and looking at his own uh, sexual tastes that came out in the wash later after he was dead and gone, right? It kind of came out in the laundry. Nowadays, it is sort of alleged that perhaps Jicky was actually an ode to a male lover, hence why it was designed in such a way with lavender and tonka and patchouli and all these heavy elements that were more redolent of the Fougere Accord, that were more conducive to what the average male taste was at that time, than what women would gravitate towards. However, the needle did eventually shift more towards women because that initial burst of male interest would then get sort of trodden over as more and more women found Jicky and eventually uh, took it back, as it were. But that was okay. Because, by that point, Amy Guerlain had made his own cologne. He made uh, Eau de Coq in uh, 1894, I believe. And it had a little bit of that civet, sour muskiness that was in Jicky, but on top of the cologne structure that his father made. And he kind of bowed out. He retired. The business went over to his nephew, who was the son of his brother, because he wasn't having kids. As I just said, his sexual predilections made him not inclined to have children, right? So he didn't produce offspring. Instead, his brother's son, Jean-Jacques Guerlain, inherited the dynasty. And then his brother, just as Aim's brother, his brother took over the family business. Now we enter the classic era that most people who knew anything about Guerlain, they know Guerlain for this era. And this is the era where I will stop this video, and then the next video we will pick up and talk about the Jean-Paul Guerlain era and forward to modern day. But this classic period, which began at the turn of the 20th century, is the period where Jean-Jacques Guerlain, or Jacques Guerlain, would create a lot of the classics that would really move Guerlain to the forefront of French perfumery and Western perfumery in general. Stuff that would basically define the way perfume smelled, regardless of who the perfumer was, regardless of who the brand was, regardless of what country it was. It could be Spain, it could be Germany, it could be the United States. didn't matter. These fragrances were more or less the blueprint, the how-to perfume for the next 50, 60 plus years, okay? Into the post-war, immediate post-war era. And fragrances like... Opera's Londe with its delicate heliotrope accord, you know, fragrances like Lerner Blue with its smooth, 
powdery, vanilla and a poppinax sort of accord, the very beginning of what we would call Guerlainade. Guerlainade didn't exist yet, but the very beginnings of it were in Le Herbleu. Following that, we would see the sheep ray called Mitsoko, released in 1919, which was an extrapolation and expansion of the sheep ray accord that was begun by Francois Coty. The big difference is Jean-Paul Guerlain made his own uh, Schieper expansion upon Jean Jacques' work, but Jean Jacques made his big expansion on the Schieper Accord by taking Francois Coty's structure, making it more transparent, and then dropping in some peach. He added some lactonic peach material, the first time a fruity note would really occur in any Western perfumery at all. The first time we would see a genuine fruity note in a fragrance is when Jean-Jacques Guerlain put it in Mitsoko. And that fragrance, like Jicky before it, became a huge success. Men liked it, women liked it. Charlie Chaplin very famously wore Mitsoko as his signature for his entire career into the 50s, all right? So don't look at any of these fragrances as being strictly marketed to women because they weren't. These classic Guerlains, Apres Lande, Jicky, all of them were basically just perfumes for anybody who wanted to smell good, <laughs> right? Now there was a capitulation to the increasing interest for dedicated male scent, for exclusive male scent. We would see that with Mouchoir de Monsieur, which I've done a video on, so I'm not going to expand upon that here at the end of this video, but Mouchoir de Monsieur was Jacques Guerlain's nod to some men being uncomfortable with wearing a fragrance shared by the other sex. So he had a friend whose wife wore Jicky and he loved Jicky. So he made Mouchoir de Monsieur so that his friend could have his own Jicky. That was more lavender, more patchouli, more tonka, and literally less of everything else. It was the only true fougere that Guerlain would have all the way up until Heritage came out in 1992. So between 1904, between 1904 and 1992, so 88 years would be the time span between the first Fougere and the second Fougere that this house would create. That whole 88 year span, they would go without making any Fougeres. Anyways, you know what comes next, Shalimar. Don't really have to tell you a whole lot about Shalimar. You already know what it is. It was Jacques Guerlain experimenting with Jicky, dropping some ethyl vanillin in it by accident, discovering a whole new thing, and then reworking it into Shalimar, which would be considered the first amber perfume, the first oriental themed perfume. Some might argue that though, but historians tend to call that what it is. I'm not going to really push it. Beyond that, we would see things like the first proper Guerlainade fragrance, just called Guerlainade, released in 1925, actually, a year later, then that perfume would be microdosed in all future Guerlain perfumes. So that Guerlainade fragrance, once available in a bottle unto itself, would be microdosed as a signature accord in every other Guerlain fragrance all the way through until the 90s where it finally kind of came to a stop. Then we would see some lesser classics. Collectors are more into these, but fragrances like Jetty and Vega, Sous Levant, and of course, Val de Nuit. These were all uh, Jean Jacques compositions as well. Val de Nuit is still technically available, but the rest of them are all gone. Jetty is gone, Vega is gone, Sous Levant has gone. But they weren't as impactful as Shalimar, as Mitsoko. It's why they kind of went the way they did. And then, of course, he would come out with Ode. His last fragrance would be in 1955, and it would be Ode. And he would make it with a very young Jean-Paul in tow, teaching him the ropes, I guess. Then after that, he would bow out. So this is the first part of the Guerlain history video. Hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for the next one.